hermetic call from out of the past. Stories, strange and weird. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Stories of the supernatural, the supernormal, dramatized by fact, the mystery, the unknown. We tell you this frankly. So if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these magnets, play, we urge you, only, seriously, to turn off your way now. Welcome back to The Horror. Thanks for joining me this Saturday. We're going to hear from The Weird Circle this week, a series produced between 1943 and 1945, aired at one time or another over mutual ABC and NBC stations. 78 episodes were produced. Our story today is The House and the Brain. This one aired July 15th, 1943. We are met in this cave by the restless sea to reveal the horror in men's minds. Listen to the weird circle. Listen to the waves. Listen closely, for you will hear the crying of lost souls. Our story discloses the horror in man's mind. This is a tale of the house and the brain. Come with me to London, through the heavy fog of the city to a large house in the suburbs. A young couple enter the portals of that house to attend an art auction. Well, hello, Jim. We've been looking all over for you. We've got quite a crowd here today. Paul Whitney, Sandra. I'm glad you've come. I thought you two were refugees from this sort of thing. Well, frankly, Jim, I've suddenly conceived a passion for good oil paintings, and I'm going to buy this fabulous painting of the ancient cutthroat. Well, to tell you the truth, Jim, she suddenly conceived a passion for cutthroats, ancient or otherwise. Oh, <laughs> my husband abuses me. I'm too nice to her, or she'd never be interested in any other man. But, darling, the man in the portrait's been dead 400 years. Dead or living, he's not beyond your charms. Oh, but my husband loves me, Jim. Must be my fatal fascination. <laughs> but I didn't come here to talk with you, even if it is fun. I came here to see that oil painting. Oh, it's quite a painting. Yes, yeah, so we've heard. It's in my study. Come and take a look before the auction starts. Hmm? Now, don't fall in love with it, Sandy. No matter how you feel about 15th century reprobates, I'm not going to spend a fortune buying useless pictures. <laughs> well, there's the picture. What do you think? He has a face you'll never forget. And a reputation. Yes, sir, he lived a full life. You know, he was supposed to have been fabulously wealthy. But when he died, his fortune disappeared. Oh, my dumpling aunt. He looks like the kind of man who sticks pins in people for the devil of it. Sandra, the strangest thing about the picture is the man's eyes. You get the feeling that the eyes are alive. Yes, very definitely. Clever work. Paul. What's the matter with you, Sandra? I could have sworn I've... I've seen that man in London recently. What man? The one in the picture. What? <laughs> <laughs> He's been dead 400 years. Stop snickering at me, Jim. I know what I've seen. Impossible. The only thing left of the Honorable Cutthroat Richards is the house on Orchard Street. He built it 450 years ago, and it's never been really habitable since. Why? Well, this is your chance to laugh at me. It's haunted. Haunted? Oh, not really. Really? Oh, Jim, Jim, I've never met a ghost. And you never will, Sandra. Jim, oh, Jim, please, please, oh, please, imagine a really, truly ghost. <laughs> Wonderful, Jim, take us over. Or better yet, I'll rent the place for a week. I've heard a lot about ghosts, but I've never been able to pin one down. You know, I've been a student of the occult for a long time. Jim, 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 please. Oh, Sandra, I'm serious. It's dangerous business, this ghost hunting. Uh, please, fella, anything to get Sandra's mind off buying that picture. Very well, but you'll find some very real ghosts over there. The housekeeper, Mrs. Browning, will rent you a room if you want one. But she's the only person who's ever been able to stay in the old house. <laughs> Thanks, old man. Come along, Sandra. But the picture. Hang the picture, my sweet. I've got a genuine ghost for you. open all by itself. There's no one there. Doors aren't supposed to open by themselves, Paul. Well, what do you expect? The house is haunted, isn't it? Hmm. 
The door slammed by himself, too. Woo! Tricky place, isn't it? You frightened? Not in the least. And it isn't my knees that are shaking, pet. It's yours. Wonder where the housekeeper is. Her name's Mrs. Browning. Call her and see what happens. All right. Mrs. Browning! <laughs> Don't poke me, Paul. I didn't poke you. Well, I didn't poke myself. Oh, hey. I wonder if we're alone. Look behind me, Paul. If it's a ghost, I don't want to meet it quite yet. Silly, it's broad daylight. Anybody knows ghosts never appear until nightfall. Oh, Paul, look. It's the child's footprint right there in front of me, a wet footprint. Great heavens. No, another one. Looks like the footprint of a child who's taken a bath. Oh, my chubby ass. Listen. The footprints lead upstairs. Shall we follow? Well, it's the obvious thing to do. It's ghastly cold in here, Sandy, isn't it? Ghostly cold at any rate. Uh-huh. You're not quite up to form, old girl. You sure you want to go through with this? No, I'm positive. Oh, oh, most anyway. Sandy, the footprints, they disappear. Oh, maybe, maybe it's all done with mirrors. Good afternoon. Do come in the sitting room. Oh, you must be Mrs. Browning. I'm Sandra Whitney, and this is my husband. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Danvers told me you were coming. Won't you be seated? Thank you, Mrs. Browning. I hope my stepdaughter didn't frighten you. Your stepdaughter? Well, I didn't see anyone. Naturally. She's dead. You mean the footprints we saw? Yes, of course. Uh, you didn't see or hear anything else? No. Expecting anyone? Yes. They're coming for me shortly. My time is up, and I must die in the way they've planned it. They? Those who live in this house, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, God, Mrs. Browning, you don't really believe ghosts actually live here. Believe it? I know it. You see, Mr. Whitney, when I was first married 40 years ago, my husband, my stepdaughter, and myself moved into this house. They were here then. Why didn't you move out? Oh, we became used to them. Then my stepdaughter died. My husband had an unfortunate accident, and I was left alone. You've lived here alone ever since? Yes. Waiting for them to take me. Mrs. Browning, how much will you charge my wife and myself for an apartment here by the week? Charge? Nothing. Nothing at all. Anybody who has the courage to stay here is most welcome. But I advise you against it. Listen. What is it? Souls crying for relief. Release from him. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning. You don't believe me? <laughs> you will when you move in. When can I expect you? Tonight at eight. How about it, Paul? That sounds jolly. You'll use the east wing. I'll have a fire lit for you. But let me warn you once again. They'll be waiting for you. Day and night. <laughs> Sandra, all back? Of course, Paul. Down, Blackie. Down, I say. Oh, if you keep squirming, I'll never get you on a leash. I'd better take some pistols along with us. Well, I'm not at all sure you can shoot a ghost, Paul. I'm not at all sure it is a ghost. Something awfully phony about all that. Oh, no. My intuition says there were ghosts in that house, darling. And I've a very perceptive intuition. Sandra, you're not going to take Blackie with you. Well, of course I am. He's a watchdog, isn't he? But a dog. Now, darling, remember how nicely he caught pheasant last year. But pheasant aren't the same thing as ghosts at all. Stuff and nonsense. You ready? All ready. Here's your coat, dear. Oh, look out the window, Paul. So peaceful out there. You've always been partial to twilight. Oh, reminds me of the time you courted me. <laughs> it was such a nice day. Paul, that man, the one on the street. What man? The one standing right out there. Look at him. That's the same man whose portrait we saw at Jim Danvers' house today. Sandra, Sandra, where are you going? To talk to him, Pat. Call him. <laughs> My chubby aunt. It is him. Oh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help noticing you and... You noticed me? 
You are Mr. Richards, aren't you? I've been known to many, by many names. Oh, dear, please pardon me if I'm rude, but well, how in the devil did you manage to stay alive for 400 years? You will notice my eyes. Look deep. Deep. Oh, let me go. Let me go. Deeply into my eyes. You've never seen me before. You don't know me. You can never remember me again. Keep walking, Sandra. I hope you're properly ashamed of yourself, approaching strange men and asking them silly questions. Well, I'm sorry, Paul. It was stupid of me, but anybody can be wrong. Well, of course they can, but on the face of it, it was silly. Expecting a man who was alive 400 years ago to be roaming around loose. It wasn't a matter of looseness, Pat. It was a matter of liveness. Now, now, come on. Stop being a husband and hold my arm. I ought to tear it off and beat you over the head with it. Mm, he's so virile. But I love him. <laughs> well, come along, Sandy. There's your haunted house ahead. We don't want to keep Mrs. Browning waiting. Or the ghost. <laughs> that door again. Insidious feeling door opening and slamming. Mrs. Browning! Mrs. Browning! I'm in the east wing, Mr. Whitney, just lighting the fire. You better go on up. This hall's drafty. Hey, Paul, it's more than cold in here. It's almost as if something or somebody is draining your body of all warmth. That's a pleasant thought, Sandy. Now that you've scared yourself stiff, move. Well, I was just getting in the mood for go. Where's the east wing? This way, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, hello, Mrs. Browning. Well, this room looks cheerful. It's as gay as my mood. Nice fire, nice candles. <laughs> quiet, quiet, Black. Don't scare somebody. <laughs> A dog scare somebody? Not tonight. They came tonight. What came tonight? You'll see. Better make yourselves at home while you can. Blackie, sit down. Over here, Blackie. Look at him, Paul. The hairs on his head are standing on end. Be quiet, Blackie. Blackie! Look! I told you they were here. A luminous mass. A blue mass. Sandy, be careful. It's materializing. Coming for me. I knew it. Coming for me. Oh, Mrs. Browning, Paul. Fingers are choking her. Good heavens. Mrs. Browning. Paul, oh, Paul, stop this horrible Cutting. thing. Cutting. 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 It's horrible. It's all right, Sandy. It's all right, darling. Oh, it's, it's gone, hasn't it? Yes. It's gone. But Mrs. Browning, she's... tells Detective Hodges that a flesh-and-blood woman gets bumped off by a ghost. But I saw it myself. Oh, be quiet, Blackie. If you'd only relax, Detective Hodges, and go away, we'd catch the ghost for you. Quiet! I'm only trying to help, but I... Blackie, stop! Sandra, you're only confusing the issue. Paul's right, Sandra. Sit down over here. Jim Danvers, if you side with Paul, I'll never speak to you. Now, Mr. Whitney, if you don't mind, 
We'll go over the details again. What happened? Well, Mrs. Whitney and I were here in this room with Mrs. Browning when a blue mass suddenly floated in the door. The lights in the fireplace dimmed, the candles were extinguished, and Mrs. Browning began to scream. Why? Because she saw a ghost. It's really all so simple. Sandra, my dear. And then what happened? The mass suddenly materialized, at least sufficiently, for us to see two hands. Two hands without a body. The hands reached out, grasped Mrs. Browning by the throat, and... That was that. Thank you, Mrs. Whitney. I suppose you expect me to believe that story? There's no reason for you to doubt Mr. Whitney's word, Detective Hodge. I'm not saying there is. But there was only three people in this room, and one of them is dead. Everybody's under arrest. Everybody, do you hear? Oh, Paul, it's here again. Look, Detective Hodge. Uh, Paul, Sandra. Oh, Paul, for heaven's sake. Uh, uh, what is it? An axe murderer in ectoplasm. Sandra, don't be funny. Let's get out of this house before it gets all of us. It's gone. Yes, it's gone. Now do you believe us, Detective Hodge? Yes. Yes, I, I believe you. I'll have Mrs. Browning's body removed to the morgue right away. Paul, if you insist on staying in this house overnight, I'll not be responsible for what happened. But, Jim, I'm convinced that there are no such things as ghosts. Now, now, please, Jim, take Sandra back home and leave me. I'm not budging without you, Ken. Sandra, don't be foolish. Well, no matter what you two do, I'm not staying here. Oh, go, old fuzzy beard. Take thy tired body and deliver it to a safe, warm bed. Poor Jim. Scared of a little ghost. It's 11 p.m. already. Well, good night, Paul, Sandra. Nighty night, Jim. What was that? You mean the footfalls? Yes, what is it? The housekeeper's dead stepdaughter. You see, it's all so simple. Good grief. Good night. <laughs> oh, we've been all through the house, Paul, and I'm dead tired. Come on, let's go to bed. You go to bed. I'll sit up and read these letters we found in the attic. <laughs> Here, Blackie, come here, come here. Now lie down next to me. There, poor Blackie, poor doggy. You don't like the ghosties, do you, pet? Poor, poor Blackie. Hey, this letter's interesting. What is it? Evidently a letter from the housekeeper to her husband. A love letter. She talks about her brother's child. It seems her brother left his money to his daughter and she handled the estate for the child. Hmm, that's jolly. Maybe that's the child she calls her stepdaughter. Hmm. Uh, let's see what it says. Listen. Since we have managed the child's end, you and I are more than lovers. We are partners in many things. Sounds as if they murdered the child. Yes, it does. Sandra, I wonder if my theory's right. If people felt strong passions, and if those passions linger in a house after the people have gone, couldn't that create a heavy psychic atmosphere? Well, those fingers that murdered Mrs. Browning were more than heavily psychic. Unhook the collar of my dress, Paul. Where do I put the letters down on the dressing table here? Just a top hook. Oh, uh, better keep these pistols handy just in case. Something about a gun that gives me courage. Funny. Oh, it's midnight. I'm tired and nothing's funny. You know Mrs. Browning's sitting room? It seems to be an extra addition to this house. It, it juts out from the rest of the building like a sleeping porch. What's funny about that? Well, that horrible cold and the footfalls all seem to emanate from that room. Oh, you and your logical mind. Oh. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, look. The fire's dimming. Oh. Just, oh. Just like a great black shadow standing in front of it. Give me my gun. Here, dear. Shh, Blackie, shh. Look, Sandy. A hand reaching out from the wall. The letters. It's got the letters. Great Scott. Oh, my chubby aunt. Watch it. It's the hand of, of the housekeeper. How do you know? It's got the same ring on she had on this afternoon. If that's not a ghost, I've never seen one. The fire's going out, Sandra. Ah! Sandra! It's all around us! Sandra! Sandra! Ah! Your will against mine. My will is greater. No. Succumb, succumb. My will is greater. No, you're a shadow. A 
And you are a mere mortal who knows no secrets beyond the veil. I control the world of shadows. Succumb, fool, succumb. No, no, go away. You're nothing but an image. You will die by my command in this house. You will die before morning. Admit my will. No, no, I will not admit your will. Sandra, you're safe now on your own home. Just lie still, darling, and drink this. Oh, Paul. I was a fool to allow you to stay in that accursed place last night. I ought to have my head examined. I came over as soon as I got your message, Paul. Oh, come on in, Jim. Sandra's recovering from a bit of a shock. Yes, I heard about it. I warned you, Paul, that house is definitely haunted. I'm going to board it up. It's completely useless. No, that's not the answer, Jim. It isn't ghosts. At least, not in the real sense of the word. Why, Paul, after what you went through, you say that? It's too malignant for a ghost. Do you believe in the power of hypnotism? Well, I've heard some amazing theories about it anyway. Well, I believe some power controls that house. Well, that's still ghosts. No, because the brain that controls the house is still alive. I'm convinced of it. Well, where do you think this man who controls the house is? He might be thousands of miles away. Remember you said that the eyes in the picture of the fabulous Richards seems alive? Oh, that's ridiculous. Not at all. In some crazy, mad manner, Richards has kept himself alive all these 400 years. In some hypnotic way, he controls that house. Well, if your theory is right, how can we break his control? Well, I'm certain that his control emanates from the little sitting room, which once belonged to Mrs. Browning. Yes. Now, if you'll let me... I'd like to hire workmen and tear that room off the rest of the house. Oh, but Paul, but the room is only an extra addition, Jim. It can't do any harm to try. Okay, pull up more of that flooring. Did you hurt yourself climbing that partition, Sandra? No. Oh, imagine a secret room down here, Paul, right beneath the sitting room. You see, Jim, Paul was right. Why, it's like finding a box with a false bottom. That's all for now, boys. Uh, careful of your head, Sandra. This room isn't very big. But it's as cold as cold storage. Well, now you know how a hunk of beef feels in an icebox. That's gay. <laughs> a musty old room. Bed and four walls. And two drawers built into the wall over there. All modern conveniences. Uh, try to open them. They look rusty. Just pull. All right. Uh, there. The drawer's open. Oh, nothing but a lot of musty old clothes. Listen, Paul. Nothing unusual, Jim. Just the same footfalls we've been hearing all along. I'm beginning to become quite fond of them. Look, here. Why, it's a miniature painting. Yes, a painting of Mr. Richards. Look at it. The same face as that painting in my house. Look at the eyes in the miniature. Paul, they're alive. Great heavens. They're moving. You better put that portrait down, Paul. Yes, they are alive. Living matter in a painting. Oh, Paul, it's getting colder in here all the time. I feel faint. Faint and... Is this something... Unearthly, he's moving around. Open the next drawer, Paul. Hurry, I don't like this growing cold at all. Uh, it won't budge. Yeah, the blasted thing. Ah, oh, there it is. Why, Paul, there's a thin china saucer full of crystal liquid with a compass floating on it. That's a strange thing. Hmm. There's an inscription written in the drawer. What's it say? As this compass moves, so my will dominates everything within these four walls. Everything dead or alive. Accursed be the house and restless the dwellers therein. What's it mean? This is the brain, Sandra. Oh. Richards controls this instrument through hypnotism. He can control a piece of paper or a chair or even the souls of the dead. Then this house is haunted. Yes, haunted by a malicious, malignant will. It keeps a man's spirit roving restlessly after death. Paul! Paul, look! Look in that corner! Mr. Richards, you... You are alive. Yes, alive. Quite alive. Because I will to live. Very clever deduction, Mr. Whitney. Deduction? Yes, I heard your keen analysis of my activities. You are a hypnotist, then. I have been powerful for 400 years. Your blind stumbling onto my secret will not stop me now. I can will anything. I will the specters of the past to re-enter this room. In heaven's name, man, stop this. Oh, that black shadow. It's here with us. Closing in. Yes, closing in. All those who have died in this house are my slaves, as you will be my slaves in a very few brief seconds. You are not the brain controlling this house. 
You gave that power to this compass. You transferred your power to this moving needle. Am I right, Mr. Richards? Put that compass down. Oh, no, I'll destroy it, Mr. Richards. No, you're completely powerless to harm us. Watch out, Paul. This partition's going to crumble. Paul! Sandra! Paul, it's good to be back in our own home. What happened to Mr. Richards when the petition collapsed, Jim? Well, the workmen searched the debris around the house for Mr. Richards' body, but no trace of him was found. I'm afraid that he escaped. Oh, no. You mean he's still alive and free, Jim? Yes, indeed. That's just what I mean. Well, he won't be for long, Sandra. People everywhere will be warned, and every corner of this earth will be looking for him. Even his will can't defy the world, Sandra. No one man can ever fight the world. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the house and the brain. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. for the horror for this week. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Find more from The Weird Circle, past episodes of The Horror, more old-time radio of all varieties at relicradio.com. We've got thousands of episodes to listen to there, all available for free thanks to your support. If you'd like to help out, visit donate.relicradio.com. Click on a donate link on the website. Your support makes it all happen. Thanks to those who have helped out. Thanks for joining me today. Talk to you again next Saturday with another episode of The Horror. Presents tales of the strange and bizarre, the weird and the wicked. Stories not necessarily of the supernatural, but of the unnatural. Join us now for Strange Tales, featuring radio drama at its most mysterious and unusual. This is Strange Tales. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me this Sunday. We're going to hear from the CBS Radio Mystery Theater this week, a series that aired from 1974 to 1982, produced almost 1,400 original shows. It was broadcast thousands of times. Our story today is from February 10th, 1975. It's titled Journey into Nowhere. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall at my usual stand. 5,000 years ago is just a minute ago, a blink of the eye to some men. To them, the morning of the world is just a tick of the clock away. 
They are that small group of scholars and scientists known to the rest of us as archaeologists. Men and women who coax the secrets of the past out of the bosom of an ancient earth, who scratch the long hidden wonders of antiquity from a soil grown hard with time. Your shop is filled with so many strange and beautiful things. Might you possibly have any samples of pottery? Ancient pottery. I have many such beauties, sir. Local ones? Even fragments, broken pieces? Discovered in some long-forgotten cave or excavation? Something like this? Uh, sir, if you know what is good for you, leave my shop at once. Well, what's wrong? Ever since I got here, everyone in this town seems to Leave, be... leave, I beg you. I, I have nothing for you. Go back to wherever you came from. You carry danger with you. You carry death. Our mystery drama, Journey into Nowhere, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss and stars Kurt Benson and Joan Lovejoy. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When you say but, you said a lot of things nobody else can say. When you say but, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. When you say but, you've said the world that means you like to do it all. Anheuser Busch, St. Louis. I can't find a decent job. I mean, it's not like I haven't tried. There must be somebody who wants me, but I can't find him. In this entire city, now there must be one person I can hire with the qualifications I'm looking for. Well, why can't I find him? There's a fast modern employment service bringing people and jobs together. Job service. Last year, we filled over 4 million jobs. In 40 years, we've never charged a fee. We use computers, personal interviews, anything that puts the right person in the right job. If you don't have a job, or you're in the wrong job, or you're looking for someone to do a job, call job service, or you may never find each other. We're working to get people working. For job service, contact your state employment service. A message on behalf of the U.S. Department of Labor. In a far-off country near the Persian Gulf, the sun has been beating down brutally, blisteringly all day. Now, with the day almost at its end, it begins to take on the shape of a huge kettle of burnished bronze. Native workmen have been digging under that blazing sun in the white sands that are hemmed in on three sides by towering black cliffs. For weeks, they have been excavating on the site of an ancient civilization for a group of American archaeologists under the leadership of the distinguished scholar, Dr. Carlo Oresti. Everybody! We're all very tired. Pespahu, Allah Khairi. Good night to all of you. Al Shukri. Thank you. Uh, they put in a good day's work, Dorothy, and so have I. I'm, I'm absolutely bushed. How about you? <laughs> it's been a long day. And a disappointing one. Not much to show. Not because we didn't try, Dr. Oresti. Almost two months. All we've turned up are two or three promising leads. 
Now, when I was a student of yours not so long ago, you taught us that where there were promising leads, there was hope. Yes, but sometimes it's a little discouraging. Here we are where it all began, ancient Mesopotamia. Cradle of civilization, conquered, invaded by every warrior nation of history from time immemorial. And all we've turned up from the treasures of these these vanished people is something close to a big fat zero. Well, we still have a month. Every dig that's ever been made here in Al Jazeera has been a good one. Oh, you were always a very good student, Dorothy. But I won't be happy until... Until someday you find what's been bugging you all your life. The Majira inscription, right? I have a, a gut feeling, an instinct that it could be right here. Somewhere underneath these hands. And if I find it, I'll hold a key to one of the deepest secrets of all mankind. Good Lord. What's that? Well, it can't be thunder. Not at this time of the year. And the sun shining? What on earth? Oh, hold it, Dorothy. Right. Stand, stand still. That's an earth tremor. What? I never heard of an earthquake in this part of the world. Look, quick. Quick, Dorothy. Duck under the shelter. It's getting worse. Uh, Dr. Arresti, watch out. That support beam over your head. Where? It's, it's getting to crack. Are you all right? I... I think so. A little, little bump on the head. I, I guess I got away from that falling beam just in time. Well, that earthquake or whatever it was came out of nowhere. Strange. You, you think it might have disturbed anything in the dig? I doubted it. It didn't last more than several... Dorothy. What? Don't move. Stay right where you are. What is it? Look there. The sh- it's a shard. A piece of broken pottery. The earth tremor must have dislodged it. And we were standing almost on top of it. Get out your brush. Yeah. Clean away the sand as carefully as you can. Yeah. It's beautiful. And we're the first to lay eyes on it in thousands of years. Careful. Look, there's writing on it around the circumference. Yes, let's see. Oh, of course, that's pre-Hellenic Greek. 3,500 years old if it's a day. Erebos, Uranu, Meson, Kthonoste. Something about heaven and earth. A place of darkness midway between the deepest earth and highest heaven. Now, wait a minute, Dorothy. Look here. Look, mm-hmm. around the edge just before it breaks off. Well, that looks like... That looks like... Majira. 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 Exactly. Dorothy, this is it. It has to be. The Majira inscription. And look, this little piece of black glass over here. Well, that looks like obsidian. It's no bigger than a dime, shaped like a face, an animal's face, and a little hole at the top. And, and little ears and eyes. Like the tiny head of a... A sheep or a lamb. Dorothy, you remember from your reading who Majira was. One of the goddesses of vengeance, wasn't she? The principal one, the spirit of revenge. Able to confuse and benumb men's minds with a potion called Nephalia. And when she wept... She wept tears of blood. Yes, I remember. And she kept changing her appearance from one creature to another. Her favorite disguise was a sheep or a lamb... Do you recall that she even assumed different shapes at one and the same time? Of course. Oh, this has to be it. This little lamb's head of black glass confirms it. Now, if I can only find the missing part of this inscription, it could lead to the elimination of everything in our lives that's corrupt and evil. Oh, there's that rumbling again. And it's getting very dark. Doctor, let's get into the jeep and go back to the camp before anything really serious happens. I'm frightened. Tomorrow morning, I leave for the mountains of the west. That's where the whole myth of Majura began. There, 
this piece of broken pottery may be the passport to the most important discovery a man could ever make. You change your mind about this trip. Oh, there is nothing to worry about. You have your bus ticket. Right here in my pocket. And my revolver, just in case. Well, let's hope you'll have no reason to use that. Doctor, I'll ask you one question. Uh -huh. In the mountains of the West, where you're going, you say that Nigeria is very real to the people who live there. That's one of the reasons I'm going. You mean to say they actually claim to see us? So they say. In different forms, under different names. And if she exists for them... She will exist for you? Until I find her and try to destroy her. But how do you destroy something that doesn't really exist? A myth? A legend? It's not as if Monsieur was really an actually living creature. Well, that's just the point. If I can find a way to destroy the idea of Majira in the minds of the people, then the idea of vengeance of of getting even with the other fellow will be killed. It may be the beginning of a way to find peace in the world. I see. But be careful, Dr. Oresti. And good luck. Thank you. Oh, oh, by the way, I put a string through the hole in the little black lamb's head we found at the dig, and I'm going to wear it around my neck as an ornament, like this. For uh, protection? Oh, why not? If that doesn't protect me, I don't know what will. Order! Order! Yaxi Hal! Please carry these for me. Min Pandruk! And get me a taxi, please. A taxi! Where is it, Oh, Porter, where are you going? Well, why are you running away? What's wrong with you? I guess I can carry my own bag, find my own taxi. Something about that, Porter. Oh, kindness. Oh, for the love of Allah. Oh, have compassion for the misfortune. Here, 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 take this. The blessings of Allah. The blessings of Allah. God go with you, Allah. Save your blessings, good woman, for an object more worthy than I. May all your days. No! Allah protect me! Take your money. May God protect me from all evil. She, she threw away the money I gave her. But, but what can be wrong? Welcome. To the street of the Seven Silver Smith. Oh, 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 where did you... Uh, permit me to introduce myself. Mahmoud bin Said, your most humble servant. Proprietor of this modest shop behind you. House of Mahmoud, rarest curios. Won't you enter and grace my poor establishment with the honor of your presence? Uh, look, Mr. Mahmoud, I've just arrived on the bus. It was a long, hard trip. All I want is a bed and a bath and hey, a little rest. I understand perfectly. Won't you please step inside my shop, Mr. Oresti, Dr. Carlo Oresti. Well, if you insist, but just for a minute. Uh, through these curtains, if you please. Ah, welcome. This is my home as well as my shop, you see. Uh, may I offer you a glass of mint tea? Well, not at this moment, thank you. Oh, your shop is beautiful. <laughs> thank you. And what an assortment. Old Berber rifles, ancient knives, swords from all over the world. All of them razor sharp. Yes, and these strange masks, grotesque statuettes. With all these wonderful things you have here, would it be possible that you might also have samples of pottery, ancient pottery, shards, fragments, broken pieces that might have been found in this region, in caves, or in an excavation? Like this? Uh, a moment until I put on my spectacles. <laughs> At my age, it's necessary to... Dr. Oresti, if you know what is good for you, leave my shop at once. Well, what's wrong? 
Ever since I stepped off the bus, everyone in this town seems to be... Leave, leave, I beg you. I I have nothing for you, nothing. Go back to wherever you came from. You carry danger with you. You carry death. Go, go. Don't push me, please. Just, Just tell me why and I'll go. Why does everyone run away from me? And what are you talking about? I carry danger. I carry death. That talisman, the little animal head you wear about your neck, you know its meaning. It is one of the faces of Magiera. This is why people run away from you. You terrify them. Well, then I'll take it off. You are trying to destroy Magiera, correct? Abandon your search. For she will destroy you first. I am not frightened. You should be. My people are, and they know. They know Magiera. She fills them with a terror that cannot be measured. You are familiar with her weapons? I think so. The tears that are not tears of salt, but tears of blood. The potion that dulls the senses. The many different shapes that she assumes to confuse you, especially that of the Black Lamb. I know them all. And you know that above everything else, Magira will stop at nothing, nothing, to keep her secret hidden. The secret you are trying to uncover. I know the risk is great, and I'm willing to take it. (laughs) What was that? Who's laughing? What laughter? I hear nothing. I could have sworn I heard the voice of a girl, a a young girl, laughing. You imagined it, I am sure. Now, if you will permit me to show you a few of my treasures. Ah, if you will look over your head, just above the chair on which you're sitting. I see it. A coat of mail. No, no, no. Next to the coat of mail. What's that? That that stuffed animal head mounted up there on the wall. Oh, no, no, no. It is nothing, Dr. Oresti. The local taxidermist had no room for it. He he gave it to me. Well, why do you keep it? It's a curiosity. The head of one of our local mountain sheep. (laughs) That laughter. It seems to be coming right out of the mouth of that lamb. From the most ancient times, the lamb was the animal designated to be the symbolic victim of man's sacrifice to his gods. And now a lamb, a black lamb, has once again become symbolic. Only this time, for Dr. Carlo Oresti, it seems to have taken on a feeling of evil. But evil or not, it may lead him to the unraveling of a secret he thinks could begin to change the course of all mankind. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Give your hand to a friend. Give your heart to your love. But give your courage to conquer. The sooner the better. Six or three or one. That's the question when you catch the common cold. Then take 12-hour contact. You need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three cold pills, one every four hours, or just one contact capsule. For up to 12 hours, continuous relief from sneezing, congestion, drips. The tiny time pills do it. For aches and fever, the others contain aspirin. Contact doesn't. Your cold, your choice. Six or three or one. Give your cold to contact. A number one cold medicine in the whole world. Give your cold. Six or three or one. Take contact only as directed. In God We Trust, America Speaks. Abraham Lincoln's creed, I believe in God, the almighty ruler of nations, our great and good and merciful maker, our father in heaven, who notes the fall of a sparrow 
and numbers the hairs on our heads. I have a solemn vow registered in heaven to finish the work I am in, in full view of my responsibility to my God, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives me to see the right. Presented by the Catholic Communications Foundation. Dr. Carlo Oresti, archaeologist, has traveled halfway around the world searching for a piece of pottery thousands of years old. He has unearthed part of it. He is convinced that if he can find the rest, it may lead to a revelation that could bring a more peaceful world. He sits in the curio shop of Mahmoud bin Said, staring at the stuffed head of a small black lamb mounted on the wall. <laughs> Who is that, Mr. Mahmoud? I, I told you, nothing... That laughter, it seems to be coming right out of the mouth of that stuffed lamb's head up there. <laughs> Dr. Horesti, you're out of match. No, no. It's going outside into the street. Where are you going, Dr. Horesti? I must follow that laughter. No, no, stay where you are, please. Don't try to stop me. I'm following it. It keeps... It keeps moving around. But now where has it gone to? May I help you, sir? Huh? Well, where did you come from? Does that matter? I am here. You are a stranger. You now have a friend. Oh, that's very, very kind of you, I'm sure. You will meet every friend you can get. You're a very interesting young lady and a very pretty one, too. Beautiful, long black hair. Your words are most generous. Who are your parents? Where do you live? And, uh, forgive me, please, but have you no better clothes than these that you wear? You question much. My parents, who knows? I live where I wish. Beats on right. I prefer them. Why have you come to this place? What are you hoping to find here? My work brings me here. I'm looking to uncover one of the deepest secrets of the world. What I should be looking for at this moment is a place to sleep. I've traveled a long way. I'm tired. At the end of this street, there is the inn of the one-eyed camel. It will suit you. This thing you are looking for. Whatever it may be. If you find it, what then? Well, then I, uh, I will have things to do. Ah, you have an idea where to find what you are searching for. Maybe I do. Some place of darkness. What? A place of little light. Who are you? I am your friend. But those words, where did you... Too many questions. Oh, come. Take my hand. Something... Something is happening to me. I... I... I, I find it difficult to breathe. To walk. You are tired from your long journey. Here. Drink from this little flask. It will help you. Drink deeply. So, so sweet, like, like, hold on to my hand. Don't let go, I, I think I'm going to faint. Girl, where are you? Where have you gone? <laughs> Erebus, Uranu, Mesong, a place... Darkness midway. No, no, no. Don't try to move. Be quiet, Dr. Oreste. You will be well. Well, who are you? Oh, you're the man from... The man from the curio shop. Mahmoud bin Said, at your service. What happened? I, I... I... I left your shop looking for a place to sleep. I know, I know. Well, where am I? What place is this? You are in my humble home. 
At the back of my small shop. You are welcome. How did I get here? You are taken ill. Momentarily. You, you fainted in the street. I, I, I remember. She, she gave me something to drink. Who gave you something to drink? As I left your shop, a young, a young girl came up to me. She seemed to know what I was here for. What else? Why, I, I asked her who she was. She took hold of my hand. I, I grew dizzy. And she gave you something to drink. Very sweet. Yes, yes. And then I, I just passed out. I have done my best to warn you, Doctor. She knows why you are here. And she will do all in her power to destroy you. Dr. Oresti, go back to your own country. What are you talking about? I am talking about Magiera. Who else? Are you telling me that the young girl in the street... Shh, 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 shh. Rest quietly, sir. I will go bring you some cold water to drink. I shall be but a minute. It's so dark in here I can hardly see is it night? <laughs> you? The girl who... How do you feel? What did you give me to drink? A small drop to warm the mind, the heart, the soul. Where are you? I can't see you. It's grown so dark. Here, at the back door. Rise from your bed and follow me. Follow me. And trust me. Here is the cold water, Dr. Oresti. How did she get in here? Again? You saw her again? Yes, she was right here beside the bed. Sir, I fear most gravely for your safety. I'm not afraid, Mr. Mahmoud. I have a mission to fulfill. More important to you than your life? I've already wasted too much time. I'm going. No, stay where you are. Take your hands off me. Let me up. I plead with you. Do not leave this room. I have an appointment, and I'm going to keep it. And where is that? I'm not absolutely certain. All I know is that it's a place of darkness, midway between the deepest earth and highest heaven. <laughs> We are almost at the summit of the sacred mountain. I, I must rest again. My, my head is so light. The air is so thin. We must be up six, seven thousand feet. Do not stop. I will help. There. We have come to the summit. The very top. Of the mountain. Everything is pitch black. There's not a star in the skies. It is past midnight. And perhaps a storm comes. You will stay here with me? I led you here. I have not the slightest intention of leaving you. Uh, tell me, why have you brought me to the top of this mountain? Because... It is sacred to us. Here, sit down beside me on this flat rock. Oh, your hand. It is bleeding. Oh, it's nothing. I scraped it on a rock as we were coming up. I kiss your bleeding hand. The taste of your blood is exciting. Hold me in your arms. Tighter. Look into my eyes. I... I can't. What's wrong? There's a pain in the back of my head. I can hardly see. My... My head is beginning to spin. It is the height of the sacred mountain. You are not no, used don't, to... Don't let me fall. Of course not, my dear. For you. <laughs> the very best of care. <laughs> came over me. There was a stabbing at the base of my skull. You are a fool. Why do you not return to your own country 
instead of playing this child's game. Child's game? That piece of pottery you have in your knapsack. How do you know about that? I never told you. Ask no questions. That piece of pottery will lead you nowhere. It is meaningless. It won't be when I find the missing fragment. And do you think you will find it? Where? A place of darkness. Midway between the deepest earth and highest heaven. Yes? <laughs> you fool. Where do you think you are? This mountain is 8,000 feet above the level of the sea. The top of this mountain is midway between the depths of the earth and the highest point we see in the heavens. Darkness? Huh. A place of darkness? Can you see your own bleeding hand in front of your face, you blundering fool? How dare you talk to me that way? Uh. Oh. You struck me. You dare to strike me! <laughs> Look! See what you have done! You're weeping. You... You have made me weep. <laughs> Bring your lantern to my face. Your tears are streaming down your cheeks. Tears... A bright red blood. Now let me get my handkerchief. I'll wipe the blood from your cheeks. And what else do you see? My very good friend. Your face. Your face is changing. You're becoming an ugly old woman with cracked skin. And your hair. And my beautiful long black hair. Is turning into writhing, terrible snakes. Their jaws are filled with poison. Which they will spit at you. Hold me in your arms as you did before. No, no I can't. Caress my shining black hair. My black hair. They're squirming serpents. They're spitting out their venom. You want me to die. Dr. Oresti. Dr. Oresti. Are you here? Over here. Dr. Oresti, where are you? Oh. Oh, I never thought I would make it to this summit. Ah, oh, oh, you all right, good sir? I... Uh, I think so. How did you know I was here? I knew the danger. I followed you. Where is she? Has she gone? The girl, again. I came close to losing my life. I think I would have if you hadn't come when you did. Fortune has been kind this night. Now, after I... Catch my breath. We had best go back down. The dawn begins to lighten in the east. And, sir... Yes, Mr. Mahmoud. Would you like to take our little friend with you? What friend? Where? Lift your light a little higher. There, on that flat rock. A beautiful little black lamb... I'll carry it down to the village. It, it just... But where is it? Where did it go? It disappeared. <laughs> Even as Dr. Oresti stretches out his hand, the black lamb melts into air, into thin air. But just as there is a faith that moves mountains, that makes all darkness light, Dr. Oresti continues to believe. He has faith that he can find the means of destroying Majera, goddess of vengeance, and with that, a beginning to a more harmonious existence for all men. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Inside your feet you're free after all You hear freedom spirit Like a wild bird call Inside you're free Inside you're free after all Living free Living free You're on the open road 
rolling free and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. midsize car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. Nice choice, your Buick. Inside your free. Blind and a teacher? Well, we're here to tell you. There are lots of us all over the country, and we're doing other things, too. We're blind, but we're just like you. I teach visually impaired and blind in the public schools of Dade County, and I teach in the adult vocational program Braille in the evening. My certification is in visual disabilities K-12. In other words, I can teach virtually on any level through high school. I've been in the National Federation of the Blind for not as many years as I wish I had. There are problems that need to be corrected, and there are people that are interested in correcting them, which makes you feel pretty good. It gets pretty lonely out there. For further information, get in touch with your local affiliate of the National Federation of the Blind, or contact me, Kenneth Jernigan, President, National Federation of the Blind, 218 Randolph Hotel Building, Des Moines, Iowa, 50309. This message presented as a public service by this station and the members of the National Federation of the Blind. A philosopher of the Middle East has said that revenge is a luscious fruit, which, like the pomegranate or the persimmon, takes a long time to ripen. Once it comes to maturity, the taste is unmistakable, unique, and sometimes very sweet. Dr. Oresti and his companion are on top of a mountain in a far-off land. A strange girl has been with them and has vanished. Then for an instant, there was a small black lamb. As suddenly as it materialized, so suddenly it disappeared. And then... Look. Look, Mr. Mahmoud. The lamb's back again. I don't understand. Where, where, where did it come from? Where did it go? Bring your light a little closer, sir. Right near its head. Oh, so... Do you see anything peculiar about this little lamb? Its eyes. It's as if blood had been dripping from its eyes. Like tears. Tears of blood. Are you telling me, Mr. Mahmoud, that this, this little animal... I tell you nothing, sir. She was here, Mr. Mahmoud. After a time, we quarreled. She tasted my blood. She embraced me. And she tried to suffocate me. She grew old and horrible before my eyes. Her beautiful hair became poisonous snakes. Dr. Oresti, it has been a long and exhausting night for both of us. Shall we go down to the village and try to get some sleep? Not just yet. What are you doing? Put down that gun. I came almost 10,000 miles to do two things. To find the missing part of the Majira inscription, and I failed in that. And second, to destroy Majira if I could find her. Mr. Mahmoud, I have found her. The lamb is running away. Something wrong with his gun. Ah, uh, too late, sir. It has escaped down the mountainside. Now, shall we go? Wait. Just a minute. Look. Right here where the lamb was lying. Put on your glasses and look. Uh, this broken fragment of pottery that the lamb was lying on. The same shape. The same colors. It has to be the rest of the Majira inscription. Oh, watch carefully where you place your feet, Dr. Oresti. These mountain paths can be more treacherous. Thank you. I'll be careful. How much farther do we have to go? Once we get... Past this huge boulder before us, we shall catch our first glimpse of the village. Mr. Mahmoud, don't move. Uh, what is it? There. 
On top of the boulder. A black lamp. The same one. Only this time, I'll get it. Now you just watch. But what, what's the matter with you? You fell right against me. I'm most sorry. My foot slipped. Yes, and I missed again. The daughter arrested. Look, over there. But not another one. Still another black yes, lamb? Yes, and see, another, and another. A whole flock of them. And every one of them jet black. They're heading toward us. They're going to push us right off this cliff. What do we do? Stand your crown. Let me try to take care of them. What's that? It, it sounds like the voices and wings of many birds. There are thousands of them. Flying straight toward us. To the head. Well, what are they? Crows? Ravens? Black birds of some kind. They're coming in a straight line right at me. <laughs> go away, you filthy birds. Go away. Go away. You ugly things. Go away. Go away. Another glass of hot mint tea, Doctor. Thank you. You know, I, I, I can't thank you enough for getting me down off the mountain safely. I thought those crows or whatever they were were going to blind me. They come sometimes. They think of other creatures as trespassers. Yes. Now, let's get back to this shard of pottery. Uh, where did I put my spectacles? Ah, yes. Here they are. You can see the, the two pieces fit together perfectly. As I suspected they would. The colors, the shape, the design, and the inscription. Everything. Extraordinary. Now, if we can decipher it... I, I leave that to you, sir. Uh, let's see. The first word looks like... Monoi. And then... Timoria. Vengeance. Let's see now. Vengeance belongs... And then there's the other piece that fits in here that says... To Majira. And then... Then there's the word alone. Vengeance belongs to Majira alone. Now, follow the writing around the circumference. Tein e re inen se e Something about peace. Yes, peace. Peace will be found... No, no, no. Must be found in... Yes, Dr. Arresti. In... In the heart of man. In the heart of man. You understand the meaning of what you hold in your hand? Well, of course. That the place of darkness midway between the deepest earth and highest heaven is the heart of man. And that's the place where real peace must be looked for. Most interesting. There is no goddess of vengeance and there never was. She existed if she ever did only... In the minds of the stupid and the ignorant. And now you will return to your own country, screaming to the world that there is no Magiera. Is that correct, Dr. Oreste? Is that correct? What are you doing? Put down that scimitar. Are you out of your mind? You have disappointed me, Dr. Oreste. And more important... You have made me unhappy, most unhappy. It is not right for you to make me weep. It is wrong, Dr. Oresti, very wrong. Dr. Mahmoud, you are weeping. <laughs> weeping tears of blood. Of course, dear doctor. And now, would you like me to change my shape into a little black lamb? Or an old and ugly hag with snakes for hair? Or perhaps a beautiful young girl? Or a flock of crows on the mountainside? And then back again to Mahmoud, this kindly, elderly merchant of curios? Name it. I shall become what you wish when you wish it. You, you are... You see... Majira does exist. Now that you know that, this blade will make a fast end to you and your large secret. No! You there! Police! Police, come! Come quick! What is it, sir? 
How can I be of help? I've just shot someone. Killed him, I think. In self-defense. Who did you kill? How? Where? Back there in the shop. The proprietor. The proprietor? What shop? Are you blind? The curio shop. I shot and killed the man who called himself Mahmoud bin Said. Mahmoud bin Said? <laughs> That's not possible. Why not? Mahmoud has been dead for more than 200 years. What? My grandfather used to speak of him, and his grandfather before him. What on earth are you talking about? Mahmoud, the mad one. He was said to live here on this very street of the seven silversmiths, behind a kind of curio shop. The tale goes that the poor man was completely out of his mind, poor fellow. The family line ended with his death. And how... Just how did he meet his death? Well, the story is that his life was ended by a shot from a gun. And who shot this Mahmoud? A stranger. A man who for some reason was seeking revenge. <laughs> seeking revenge. Seeking revenge. Seeking, seeking revenge. revenge. Seeking, seeking revenge. revenge. Seeking revenge. Dr. Oresti. Doctor, how do you feel? Who is that? Dorothy. D don't try to move. You're going to be fine. Well, I, I, I don't understand. How, the the how, earthquake. How did... But it's all over now. Don't you remember? Earthquake? When you ducked into the shelter here, the big wooden beam over your head split and came right down on Of course, I, 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 I remember. I, I, I tried to get out of the way, but I couldn't. No. You had me worried there for a bit. You were out cold for a, a good whole minute. A minute? You mean all that happened in just one minute? All, all what happened? Well, thanks to that conk on the head, I'd been off on a very fascinating trip, a... A voyage to nowhere. Whatever that's supposed to mean. But tell me something, Doctor. Yes? That little thing you're wearing on a string. Where? Around your neck. Looks like the head of a little black lamb. I've never seen that before. Well, neither have I. How do you suppose it got there? <laughs> We began this tale by saying that 5,000 years ago is just a minute ago, a blink of the eye to some men. To them, we said, the morning of the world is just a tick of the clock away. For Carlo Oresti, it took just that one minute to carry him back hundreds of years to another time, another place, and another world. I'll be back shortly. Hi, this is Phyllis Diller. You know, I love being funny because it's a way to spread a little joy and happiness. Right now, I'd like to tell you how you can spread a little joy and happiness. And more than that, help some very special people. I'm speaking of our country's six million mentally retarded children and adults. Like all of us, mentally retarded people need love and affection and understanding and patience. They also need a special kind of help that will enable them to develop to their fullest. It's a big job for the people who are trying to provide help to the mentally retarded. And that's where you come in. Please lend a helping hand. I'll tell you how. Join and support the work of your local association of the National Association for Retarded Citizens. So come on, give them a hand. Make a contribution to your local association. It'll give you a nice, warm, thankful glow. I have read that there are a good many far-off places where they still devoutly believe in things like a goddess of vengeance who, to confuse the people, changes her appearance at will into any number of different shapes even into several different forms at the same time. 
I'd love to see that for myself sometime. With one reservation. I'd like to get there by the usual means of transportation. And not by a zonk on the head. Our cast included Arnold Moss, Joan Lovejoy, Kurt Benson, and E.V. Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Did, did anyone examine you? Rowan entered, looked at me, and asked me to wait. Only, only I couldn't, you see. Why not? Well, because I, I had to find somebody. I, I didn't remember who or where to begin, except with, with, with this. What is it? Just a piece of paper, like from a phone pad with a number. Three, eight, oh. What do you think it means? A, a room, maybe? There's no such room number in this hospital. Oh, I thought maybe it might, might be the old ladies. What old lady? I don't know. What was the old lady's name? I... I don't know. What is your name, miss? But that's the whole trouble, don't you see? I don't know that either. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This has been Strange Tales. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can find a lot more from the CBS Radio Mystery Theater, past episodes of Strange Tales, thousands of other old-time radio episodes at relicradio.com. You'll also find our Shoutcast stream up and running there, and you can donate through the website. It's how all of this comes to you every week. Visit donate.relicradio.com or click on the link on the website. Your support makes it all happen. Thanks to those who have helped out. Thank you for joining me today. Be back next Sunday with another episode of Relic Radio's Strange Tales. Mm-hmm.